Oh man, I don't even think you are prepared for how long this one is gonna be. Or you are, because like you all watch podcasts and they're all like really long, so. In the quiet Yorkshire town of Pontefract, a house at the end of East Drive hides an ominous legend that has terrified locals and captivated paranormal researchers for decades. The Black Monk is an alleged malevolent entity and is said to be responsible for unexplained poltergeist activity and violent attacks on an innocent family in the 1960s. Come and sit by me as we take a deep dive into the dark history and disturbing paranormal activity at number 30 East Drive, home to one of the most violent poltergeists in all of Europe. Hey friend, how has your day been today? Are you doing good? Are you staying hydrated? If you're new around here, hi, I'm Claire and I'm a lover of all things morbid, mysterious, and macabre. I have spent hours and hours absolutely enthralled in ghost hunting TV shows, but you know what I love more than night vision footage and EVPs? I love the history behind a paranormal encounter, the origins of urban legends and mysteries, and the personal ghost stories that people have experienced firsthand. So that is what we're gonna do. Every week we sit down and chat all things paranormal, swapping ghost stories like a good old sleepover, so if that sounds like your scene, I would highly recommend subscribing. Sources that I use for this episode come from the book, it's called like Poltergeist, a classic study in destructive hauntings by Colin Wilson. This was a brilliant account of the haunting that the Pritchards went through. It's very well researched and definitely worth a read. Also, like this is one of those cases where like, okay, let's be honest, it has been done to death by so many different podcasts and books. I mean, but that didn't stop me clearly. And so it's also got quite a substantial section in the book, Extreme Hauntings, uh, Britain's Most Terrifying Ghosts by Paul Adams and Eddie Brazil. I also use the book The Black Monk of Pontefract by Richard Estep and Bill Bungie. And Bill is actually still the current owner of the house, 30 East Drive. And I will be completely honest, I was a little skeptical about using this book for that reason, because Bill still owns a house. But I do have a lot of time for Richard. I think he does a really good job of presenting an impartial record on the haunted locations that he writes about. I loved his account of the Skirred Inn when he was there investigating. So based on that merit, I really wanted to give this book a go. However, obviously we will get all the way into it later on, but regardless of what you think of the motives behind it, I still definitely think it is worth a read. I did notice a couple of inconsistencies, mainly in the history between like all of the different books I used, which when you're dealing with history coming from like word of mouth and interviews, like it's bound to happen. But I really like Rich's book because it actually did a really good job of filling in the gaps that Colin Wilson's book left and giving that extra little bit of context, especially around the house today. I would also recommend that you check out Andy Evans's book, Don't Look Back in Anger. And I dare you to say that without singing the Oasis song in your head. I dare you. It's a brilliant account of his search for the truth behind the Black Monk, as well as his own experiences with investigating in the house. Anyway, let's get into it because we have so much to talk about, as you can imagine, with one of the most famous paranormal cases in the UK. And the Black Monk of Pontefract really did become one of those sensational cases, but much later after the fact. Like it was almost completely forgotten about if it wasn't for Tom Cunliffe and Colin Wilson researching and interviewing the family like years later. Now it's an internationally famous famous case. As I said, you can like hire the house out for your own paranormal investigation. And it's even the subject of the 2012 film, When the Lights Went Out. So where did one of the most violent and terrifying hauntings take place? In a quiet little town in West Yorkshire called Pontefract, not too far out from Leeds. And the house where all this took place is number 30 East Drive, which sits in a pleasant little housing estate. And to look at the house from the outside, like, it's nothing special. It's just an ex-council semi-detached home, like just like thousands of others that you would find in like any town. But obviously this particular house has an incredibly dark, violent, and some say even demonic history attached to it. But our story isn't gonna start with a house. Oh no, we're gonna go even further back than that. Because the housing estate that 30 East Drive sits on called Checkerfield was actually the site of a bloody siege during the English Civil War in 1644. Because not far from where that estate would eventually be was Pontefract Castle. Now this was under siege by the parliamentarians as the royalists had hunkered down in there and they were kind of using it as a stronghold, but they'd become isolated by the defeat earlier in the year. They were on their own, there was no reinforcements, no supplies, so they were just like in this super vulnerable, desperate position, just hoping that the parliamentarians would like, just go away. <laughs> 
please go away. The parliamentarians were like constantly firing at the castle, but eventually it would be the running out of supplies that forced the royalists out. The royalists lost 99 men, women and children from the castle, while the parliamentarians saw 762 soldiers killed on the battlefield. And that is an awful lot of blood spilled on those fields that would eventually house the residents of the Checkerfield estate. But this wouldn't be the origin story of where one of the most famous and violent poltergeists came from. Because Andy Evans, the guy that wrote one of the books, he did a bit of digging into the land around East Drive. Research, not actual archaeological digging. And he found a map that showed the area around East Drive in Checkerfield would have been an orchard, which would have possibly had monks farming there who had come from the nearby priory. The story goes that one of these monks was a very bad man. We're talking the worst. Apparently in the early 1500s, one of these monks had abducted a young girl, raped her and then killed her. He was thankfully found out where he was executed for his horrific crimes. The story goes on to say that he was cut down from the gallows, which coincidentally enough would have been just behind 30 East Drive on the hill, where he was then thrown into a well on the grounds of the orchard. And where was that well? Well. <laughs> Eyewitnesses have claimed to have seen this well when the flooring was pulled up to fix the damp problem that was affecting two houses that sat above it. One of these houses was 79 Checkerfield Road, a semi-detached house that shares a dividing wall with 30 East Drive. Weird that, isn't it? Apparently a neighbor on the estate saw this ancient well, which kind of like straddled the two properties. So like half of it sat in 79 Checkerfield Road and the other half in 30 East Drive, like, with the two houses above it. So houses on the Checkerfield estate, they were starting to pop up after the Second World War with 30 East Drive and the adjoining house, 79 Checkerfield Road, being the last two houses to be built. And pretty much all of the stories that you will see online around this poltergeist will be centered around one family, the Pritchards. But there was a family that lived in the brand new council house before they did. And from what I've read and seen in interviews, they are worth mentioning here. Bill Farrer and his wife Barbara and their baby girl Jane were the first people to live in 30 East Drive, moving in in September 1954. And at the time it was brilliant. They had a toilet inside the house. I know, but it wasn't gonna be the dream family home that they had kind of envisioned. Pretty much as soon as they moved in, weird things started happening. So basically when you get a council house back then, it would pretty much be like up to you to sort out the decorating, like putting the cupboards up and all that sort of thing. Bill Farrer was a handyman, so he didn't think this was gonna be an issue, but clearly the house had other ideas. Cupboards that he'd lined up perfectly, ready for the doors to be put on, would be like completely squiffy when he went back to them. They had constant heating issues, but the council could find absolutely nothing wrong with it. And wallpapering, like forget it, that was next to impossible. No matter what he did, what wallpaper paste he used, what prep he did to the walls, that wallpaper was not staying up on those walls. And then there were the changes in his young family. Barbara Farrer went from being an outgoing, bubbly girl to completely withdrawn, subdued, very unsettled woman. She hated being in that house. She'd constantly get on at Bill about moving ornaments off the mantelpiece when he'd had like nothing to do with it. Actually, he was kind of getting aggy about his like tools going missing and cups of tea that he'd knew that he'd put down in a specific place being completely gone when he went back for it, like thinking Barbara must have just like moved it or something. But the most worrying part was baby Jane. She would not settle in that house. She'd be crying constantly all night, but he took her to her grandma's and she'd sleep through the night fine. And I fully believe that like kids, especially young kids, infants, like are super sensitive to otherworldly goings on. So could it be that she was experiencing something? Was like something visiting her? Maybe, because that would possibly explain why she would end up with bloody scratches all over her face. Even though she'd be wearing those like little cotton mitten things that stops babies from like scratching themselves with their fingernails. Bill later claimed that they would always hear like strange noises in the house that weren't anything to do with like, you know, the normal creaks and bumps of a house settling or anything. They'd hear disembodied voices in completely empty rooms. Milk would spill out of the bottle randomly and the fabric of the sofa would get slashed apart like someone had gone at it with a knife. No matter what weirdness went on in that house while the Farrows were living there, Barbara absolutely refused to talk about it. She never mentioned what, if anything at all, had happened to her to Bill, like nothing. She said nothing. But obviously she made it abundantly clear that she hated that house. One morning when Bill got home from work after like a night shift, his wife informed them that they were gonna be moving. This is not a discussion, we are moving. <laughs> so obviously he was a bit like, um, okay. 
why, what's going on kind of thing. Barbara told him that she'd bumped into a woman called Jean Pritchard at the, like, the little strip of shops on the estate. Jean was living just down the street at 47 Checkerfield Road with her husband Joe and their two children, Philip and Diane. They'd both been talking, like, exchanging pleasantries, and eventually the conversation had got on to how they both didn't like their houses. And so Barbara just kind of floated the idea of, like, hey, well, maybe if neither of us like our houses, why don't we swap? And that was it. Jean Pritchard thought she was getting a great deal. She was moving into a bigger house with a bigger garden and that it was at the end of the road. Like, bang it, that's perfect. By the time Barbara had gone to her husband to tell him about it, she'd already sorted it all out with the council. Like, the deal was done. Bill, we are moving the hell out of this house. And this is where the dates get a little murky, as Richard and Bill's book says that the Farrows moved out of 30 East Drive in the spring of 1955, but loads of other sources say that the Pritchards moved in in, like, August 1966. So I'm not quite sure on that one because obviously if they did move in 1955, that's an awful long time between then and August 1966. So just bear that in mind. Or if you know, share it in the comments below because I'd love to know for sure. It's a pretty important detail to clarify because in August of 1966, the Pritchard family would have their first paranormal experience, their first taste of what the Black Monk of Pontefract had in store for them. To be honest, I lean towards them living there since 1955 because, as we all see, poltergeist hauntings don't usually start until there's a kid in the house. Going through puberty, which Philip was 15 at the time, and also because that August, most of the Pritchards were on holiday, which I doubt they would have booked a holiday if they'd have been moving. So it gets a little bit messy sometimes, but we do what we can. That's what we're here for, to do the best we can. So now it's the August Bank Holiday Weekend, 1966. Jean, Joe and Diane Pritchard are away on holiday in Devon. Philip had decided to stay at home at 30 East Drive. Like, he was 15 now. He didn't really fancy the whole family holiday scene. Jean's mother, so Philip's grandmother, Sarah Scholes, was also at the house, you know, just like keeping an eye on things, like looking after Philip. Like, I know you're 15, but you're not an adult yet, kind of thing. No matter what you hear about the UK, August is usually like a safe bet for nice weather, kind of. And luckily for Philip, that day it was. So he decided to take a book outside in the garden to read while Sarah sat in the living room knitting a cardigan. Like, I know it's August, gal, like getting ready for winter already. <laughs> Sarah was happily knitting away, although she didn't understand how Philip could be outside right now. Like, it was freezing in the living room, so she could only imagine how cold it was outside. Young people and their ability to not feel the cold. <laughs> that must be it. But then the wind picked up and a huge gust tore through the house. It was strong enough to rattle all of the windows and slam the back door shut. When Philip came into the house for a drink, his grandma was like, oh, the weather must be getting bad out there. Like, really windy. Like, are you gonna come back inside now? Philip had no idea what she was talking about. It was completely calm and sunny out there. Hmm, okay, Grandma. So he went to the kitchen to make them hot drinks, but when he came back to bring Sarah her tea, he stopped in the doorway, staring. His grandmother was right where he'd left her. She was happily knitting away in the living room, but all around her was a chalky, greyish white dust hanging in the air. It was kind of like a mini snowstorm, but the dust wasn't falling from the ceiling, you know, like, where it would make sense to if like the plaster was coming down or something. Oh no, this was much weirder. As Philip was standing in the living room doorway looking at this chalky fog surrounding his gran, he was like looking over the top of this cloud. And you know when you're on a plane and once you get to altitude like thousands of feet in the air, it's always sunny because you're above the clouds and you can look down and see all of the clouds. Yeah, apparently it, it was like that. But it wasn't just a weird mist or steam because this white dusty cloud was leaving a thin layer on the furniture. And the cup of tea that Philip had literally just made for his grandma had a film on it. Sarah eventually looked up from her knitting and seeing all of this mess around her, she asked Philip what the hell he'd been doing. Obviously Philip was just as clueless about what it was. Sarah decided to go to the house opposite 30 East Drive as her other daughter, Marie Kelly, lived there. When unsurprisingly, Marie also had no idea what it was, her first reaction was to clean it all up. I mean, it's understandable, isn't it, I suppose? Marie went to the kitchen to grab the cleaning supplies when she skidded across the floor. A random, perfectly circular puddle of water had formed on the floor. She cleaned it up, 
and another formed, and another. Thinking there must have been like a leak under the lino, they pulled the flooring up to reveal a completely bone dry floor underneath. Enid Pritchard, the next door neighbor, who was also part of the family, like she was married to Joe Pritchard's brother. She had heard the commotion and had come round to see like what was going on. And when I read that in Colin's book, like. I couldn't help but just laugh a little. Just reminded me of my own nan. She lives in like a little avenue and she knows everyone. They all know each other. No one can drive past in the close without her like seeing who it is, where they're going. <laughs> Bless them. Like my nan would have been 100% Enid Pritchard going around to seeing what's going on next door. So anyway, Enid's around at number 30, seeing what's cracking off. Why have you got the lino floor up? Like what's going on? At this point, they turned the water supply off to the house in case there was a leak somewhere. And they'd even called the water company company out to like come out and take a look. They poked around the drains, lifted the lino up again, like nothing. There was zero explanation as to what was causing these puddles. After the water guy couldn't come up with anything, the best explanation he could think of was that maybe it was condensation? But it was August and it had been completely dry, so that definitely wasn't it. And just as mysteriously as they'd started, about an hour after the water guy left, these puddles stopped forming. But that wasn't the end of the weirdness that day. A bit later in the evening, Philip called his grandma back into the kitchen saying, Grandma, it's happening again. There was sugar and tea leaves covering the counter by the side of the kitchen sink. When Sarah got to the kitchen to see for herself, the tea dispenser thing that was like fixed above the sink, it went off again. No one around. And based on the time period, I'm guessing it was like one of those vintage, I guess it's vintage now, but like those caddymatic dispensers that has like the big button on it and that you press and the tea comes out the bottom. So as they were both watching it in complete disbelief, the button kept getting pressed in and out, even after there was no tea left in the dispenser, because now it was all over the draining board. Finally, Sarah shouted, seemingly to no one in particular, stop it when they heard a huge crash in the hallway behind them. Like now it's getting a little bit more tense. You got puddles, tea leaves and sugar, like a one thing, but a big loud crash? Mm, yeah, not sure I would still be in that house if it was me. Yeah, like that's horror movie 101. Don't go towards a thing making the big loud crashes if you don't know what it is. But what do I know? I'm a scaredy cat. Philip and Sarah were absolutely terrified by this point. So they very slowly opened the door to the hallway, expecting to see like a murderer or something. Like there's gotta be something there, but there was nothing. They walked through the hallway just to make sure and found only one thing out of place, which was the cause of the almighty crash. A plant that usually lived at the bottom of the stairs had somehow walked its way halfway up the staircase without its pot because the pot had gone all the way up to the top of the stairs. Before they could even process what they were seeing, there was more noise coming from the kitchen. The cupboards were now vibrating and rattling, shaking all of the cups and plates inside. And now sometimes if you live in a semi-detached house where you share a dividing wall with your neighbor, sometimes if they're doing something on that wall, like drilling or hammering a nail in or whatnot, you'll be able to hear it. Ask me how I know. Thing was, these cupboards weren't on the dividing wall. There was nothing on the other side of that wall other than the garden. Sarah went next door just to confirm they definitely weren't doing anything that could like make the cupboards shake like that. And funnily enough, at that time in the evening, they were not. By that point, the activity in the house had calmed down. So eventually they decided, okay, let's try and put it all behind us. Let's just try and go to bed. Like, how could you even think about sleeping after all of that? Like, I just don't know. Sarah went to go kiss Philip goodnight when she noticed that he was in bed, absolutely paralyzed with fear staring at something behind Sarah's shoulder. The wardrobe was moving and swaying completely on its own. Yeah, that was it. They were both out of there, staying across the road at Auntie Marie's house. Marie Kelly's husband, Vic, he decided that enough was enough. Obviously there was gonna be a natural explanation to all of this weirdness. Let's get the police out. When the police arrived, they came and did a big sweep and confirmed that, yep, there is no intruder in the house. There's no earthly reason that they could find for the things happening in the house. The police left because obviously there wasn't really anything they could do. And they left the family to kind of try and think up something else. Like, 
what to do next. Vic suggested to Marie about her friend, Mr. O'Donnell, that lived just down the street. Pretty sure he was into all that ghost stuff, wasn't he? By this point, it was almost midnight, but like quite clearly, Sarah and Philip, and even Marie, they were pretty freaked out by what had happened. No one was really getting any sleep. They walked down the road to see Mr. O'Donnell, and seeing that the lights were still on, they knocked on his door to tell him the whole weird story of the day. Mr. O'Donnell listened to Vic and Marie and immediately grabbed his coat to go and check it all out for himself. Like he was a ghost hunter through and through and now there was a suspected ghost a few doors down? Brilliant. When they first entered the house, there was like this big rush of cold air, which sort of became one of the trademarks of the poltergeist. But other than that, nothing really happened. I guess it's just like any other paranormal investigation. Like if you want it too much, it ain't gonna happen. So at about quarter to two, they called it a night. But Mr. O'Donnell said something very interesting. He said to Vic and Marie that poltergeists do funny things. They're very fond of tearing up photographs, I believe. Turns out the entity must have been listening, as once Mr. O'Donnell had gone home and the Kellys were just about to lock up and go back to their house for the night, they heard this almighty crash again. But it wasn't the plant pot this time. Oil paintings and a wedding photo of Joe and Jean Pritchard lay face down on the living room floor, glass smashed and the wedding photo had been slashed completely, as if someone had just took a knife to it. And at that point, we're talking like, it's two in the morning right now. Like they just noped completely out of the house. They just locked the door and left. I can understand that. Things seem to have quieted down a little bit after that. Philip and Sarah went back to the house the morning after and nothing much really happened. The rest of the Pritchard family, Jean, Joe and Diane, they came back from their holiday the day after. Can you just imagine the conversation that would have happened after that though? Like, yeah, welcome home from your holiday. You've got a ghost. It made a load of noise and it's destroyed your wedding photo. Sorry about that. So clearly thinking that they were obviously exaggerating or just like having them on for whatever reason, Joe asked, what kind of knocks? The entity apparently answered him with a super cold chill going through the house and three loud, distinct bangs, just like the ones that Philip and Sarah had heard a couple of days ago. But it seems like the entity was done for a bit as two years went by with absolutely no activity whatsoever. But that was all about to change. Clearly the events of 1966 hadn't put Sarah, the grandmother, off too much as she carried on coming around to the house most weekends. Jean Pritchard had decided to redecorate Diane's room at this point. Like, you know, she's just turned 15 now. She's getting a bit older, sort of freshen her room up a little bit. She was taking a break and went to go make a cup of tea to drink with her mom, Sarah, in the kitchen. And Sarah had mentioned a few times by this point that she was thinking about the supposed haunting from a couple of years ago. Like it was clearly on her mind and maybe as it was coming up to that August bank holiday again, she was getting a bit worried. So she mentioned to Jean that she'd been hearing noises again, but but Jean, like having heard a lot about this from her mom lately, like kind of just waved it off and said like, oh, well, I haven't heard anything. Oh, how that was about to change. When she went out into the hall, there was like a bedspread. Like, you know, one of those like blankets that people sometimes put out like on top of their duvet. One of those was at the foot of the stairs, which was impossibly weird. Jean had come down those stairs not 10 minutes ago to make a cup of tea. Like there was no way that she would have walked past it and not noticed it. And no one else was there. There was no reason why it should have been there. Either way, thinking, yep, that's very weird. She picked it up, went and put it back in the bedroom that it had come from and went back to decorating. But the entity clearly had a point to make as a few minutes later, another bedspread would fly down to the bottom of the stairs along with all of the potted plants being violently upended and the soil from those plants going absolutely everywhere. Jean, hearing all of this crashing and wondering what the hell was going on, she rushed downstairs to find her mom, Sarah, in tears in the kitchen saying, it's all starting again. And this would become a theme of the poltergeist through the next few months, it would just love to make a mess. Later that night when Jean couldn't sleep, she decided to go and like tidy up a little bit, which obviously is something that you do in the middle of the night when you can't sleep. She went out onto the landing where she'd put all of the decorating supplies, obviously so that Diane could like get into her room, when she saw something moving. And it was pretty dark. The house was in darkness. So there was only the light of the street lamp outside. So she couldn't quite make it out. She turned the landing light on, hoping to get a better look. And just as she did that, something was launched right at her face. It missed her by millimeters. And when she looked down at where it landed, she saw that it was a paintbrush, but she didn't have much time to react as just after that, a bucket containing wallpaper paste hit the landing wall opposite her, splitting open and covering the landing in paste. And the thing that was moving, that was a strip of wallpaper. 
swaying like a frigging cobra on the landing. Auditioning for your part in Fantasia or something. Like, get out of here. Jean went to grab the bit of wallpaper and as she did, it just like, it lost all animation, just as if the entity had let go of it or whatever it did. But instead, a carpet sweeper began to swing around in what I'd describe as a pretty threatening way. It was at this point that Jean just said, yeah, I'm out. Like, this is way too weird. It was all so much and so sudden, like she couldn't even get the breath in to scream. She was so shocked. So she just kind of scrambled back into her bedroom on all fours and slammed the door behind her, just as a roll of wallpaper hit it. Finally, her brain caught up and processed everything that had just happened. And finally the screaming came, waking up her husband and the kids. All of the decorating tools were now flying around in the air, all around the absolutely terrified family. And they were moving with some force, but when a paintbrush hit Diane, she was a bit confused. Like, obviously, it felt like she'd just been hit by a paintbrush, but it didn't really hurt. The thing looked like it was moving so fast that it would have, like, absolutely pelted her, but in reality, it kind of just, like, tapped her and then fell to the floor. But even if the things flying about the room weren't necessarily to cause harm, the entity was very clearly displaying its strength. It moved to Diane's room where it ripped like a wooden pelmet out of the wall and threw it outside like it was nothing. And if you don't know, a pelmet is one of those things that you see like sitting above a window that like covers the curtain rail. They're normally secured to the wall with like massive screws because they're pretty heavy, just like this one was. And whatever it was that was causing all of this activity had just ripped it out of the wall and thrown it through an open window. Funnily enough, Diane slept in her parents' bedroom that night. I think after that, Joe Pritchard was finally starting to understand just what Sarah and Philip had experienced two years ago. Like up until this point, I think he had always been very skeptical of what had happened that weekend. And every time Sarah had brought it up, he would have just like shut the conversation down. Like, no, we're not talking about this. Like, don't be so stupid, that didn't happen. But after that night, I think his opinion changed somewhat. Even after a night like that in the house, the family would refuse to move. Like this was their house. They were absolutely not gonna be bullied out of it by apparently some paranormal force. And that's how they came to share 30s Drive with the entity called Mr. Nobody or Fred. Similarly to other paranormal cases, the activity seemed to center around a kid that was going through puberty, which tracks here as like, now we're into 1968 kind of time, Diane seemed to be the center of this. Like she was 15 years old now. The activity would be quiet during the day when Diane was at school, but then would start up around bedtime. At which point the house would pretty much descend into chaos. There would be banging, ornaments and things like flying across the room, the lights turning off by the main switch. During the family's first attempt at getting an exorcism on the house, the vicar that came around told the family that there was something evil in that house after he had witnessed a candlestick levitate right in front of his face. After the vicar had made a hasty exit, which I'm guessing after not performing an exorcism, I don't know, Diane was making her way up the stairs to bed when the atmosphere in the house turned icy cold. The lights went out and from the dim glow of the street lamps outside, Diane could make out the huge shadow of a figure on the wall. At that moment, a big like heavy oak hall stand, which is like a big cabinet thing, floated through the air and flew straight at Diane pinning her down on the stairs. And she's in almost total darkness at this point. The lights still aren't on and she's pinned down by this huge, great big heavy hall stand and a heavy electric sewing machine, which have been just piled on top for good measure. How absolutely terrifying. She was pushing it, but it was not moving. The lights came back on and Diane was finally able to scream for help. But even with Philip and Jean trying to get this thing off her, it was not budging. Like regardless of how heavy this thing was, for a 17 year old lad and a grown woman to not even be able to move it an inch, that's weird. They even claimed that it was almost like an unseen force was like holding it down in place. When it was clear that struggling against it just wasn't doing anything, Jean told the terrified Diane to just like, just try and relax. Because Jean could see like the girl looks scared, but didn't seem to be injured or anything. Like just calm down Diane, we're gonna get you out. Just like, just breathe and relax. As soon as she relaxed, whatever it was that was holding onto the cabinet let go and they were able to get it off her. Diane got up, dusted herself off, like checked herself out. There wasn't a single bruise on her, absolutely nothing. She claimed that, yeah, she was pinned with enough force that she wasn't able to move, but with how heavy the hall stand and the electric sewing machine were, there was no way that the full weight of them had been on top of her. Like she would have been crushed, but the entity wasn't done with Diane for the night. 
Once she was in bed, that familiar icy feeling came back. All the bed sheets were thrown off the bed and her mattress was violently flipped, which launched Diane across the room onto the floor. Apparently that happened four more times that night. I think after the second time I'd just give up and just not make my bed, just sleep on the floor. I mean, of course, like, let's be real, I probably still wouldn't be in that house by that point, something coming and flipping me out of bed, but yeah, I probably would not have been anywhere near that situation. But I feel like at least up until now, Diane had had the feeling that the thing never really wanted to hurt her, and that she didn't need to be scared. Like even with a huge heavy hall stand on top of her when she was on the stairs, like that probably would have or should have broke bones or crushed her. Like that didn't even leave a bruise. That's not to say that the entity wasn't violent or destructive though. Fred started to become more of like a real entity in the house as the activity seemed to just keep on escalating. In one episode when the lights went out. Oh, I get it now. That's, that's why the film's called When the Lights Went Out. Because every time something happens, the lights... That's so clever. So yeah, anyway, the lights went out and all the sandwiches that Jean had prepared were found stuffed behind the TV with one having a massive bite taken out of it. Like there were literal teeth marks in the bread. Apparently it was huge. Another time, Joe Pritchard's sister Maud came to stay who very firmly believed that there was a logical explanation to all of this and it was probably the kids just having a joke. Like don't be so silly, it's obviously the kids. That was her opinion. Nothing anyone said was gonna change her mind until the night she stayed in 30 East Drive. So one of her gloves had gone missing as things in the house tended to do, but Jean just told her, don't worry, it will turn up eventually. Aunt Maud was staying the night bunked in Philip's room with Diane and Jean. Fred wasn't gonna let them get to sleep very easily that night. Something was moving at the top of the door. Like they could see it because there was a reading light on. And this to me is absolutely terrifying. What apparently happens next, it just displays a level of intelligence that terrifies me. Like what the entity does next is deliberately just to mess with Aunt Maud's head, who has already made it abundantly clear that she does not believe in it. A hand appeared at the top of the door. A second hand appeared at the bottom of the door, about like six inches above the floor. And these hands, they were wearing Aunt Maud's gloves. I'm sure I don't need to explain to you how big a standard size door is, right? Like if you just go, if you pause this video now and go to your like bedroom door or something and you put a hand at the top of the door and try and put your hand as low down as you can, just see like how big you your wingspan would have to be to be able to do that. Having one at the top of the door and one six inches off the floor. The wingspan that a normal person would need to be able to do that is insane. Like I even tried it myself. I'm not particularly short and my second hand barely came to underneath where the door handle was. Was. Terrifying. And that's pretty much the reaction of the women. Aunt Maud screamed at the gloves to get away and that they were evil. She even picked up one of her boots and threw it at the door, at which point the gloves disappeared. One of the gloves then floated into the room and made like a beckoning motion. So yeah, of course you're gonna go towards the disembodied floating glove when it asks, aren't you? Obviously no one did, so the glove clenched its fist and started shaking threateningly at Maud. Funnily enough, she was no longer a skeptic, telling the family, you've got the devil in this house. She said that she would never stay in that house ever again, not even for 20,000 pounds. And when the gloves were inevitably later found and returned to Maud, she grabbed them with coal tongs, carried them out into her back garden and burned them. All right, Maud. Like in all seriousness, this was not a great environment to live in. Like whether the entity wanted to cause real harm at this point or not. And Vic Kelly, remember Jean's brother-in-law that lived across the street, he really thought that a Catholic exorcism was gonna be the way forward. He approached his own Catholic priest, Father Hudson, who again, wasn't too keen on doing an exorcism, but suggested that they take some holy water, try that first, see what happens. So Vic went all through the house, sprinkling the holy water and finished in the living room, which seemed to be like Fred's favorite place to haunt. Before Vic could even answer Jean's question of how long would it take to work, there was a loud crash from upstairs and streams of water started pouring down the walls. 
So yeah, I'd say it didn't work at all. And things were gonna get a lot worse. As Diane was combing her hair, she was smacked in the back with a brass crucifix that was on the mantelpiece. But it didn't just hit her and fall to the floor. Oh no, 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 no. It was like this metal crucifix was stuck to her. Obviously now she started to panic. She was like running around screaming, get it off me. And Jean tried to pull it off her, but it wasn't moving. So Diane was just carrying on screaming, running around the house at this point. Like this thing was attached to her back. Like, what the hell? Eventually, it just fell off and left Diane with a big red mark in the shape of a cross that was there for days afterwards. And if all that wasn't terrifying enough, Fred was about to take it to a whole new level. One night, when Jean and Joe were in bed, their bedroom door creaked open. Standing in the doorway was the towering, shadowy figure of a man in robes with a hood over his head. As soon as they turned on the bedside lamp to see it clearer, it vanished. The second sighting of this entity is a pretty interesting one as it wasn't actually in the Pritchard household. It was in the adjoining house next door. So like the other side of the semi-detached building. The neighbor who had moved in there by now, May Mountain, was washing up at the kitchen sink when she sensed, you know, like when you get someone behind you, like you can just sense that someone's there. So you turn around and then it's like the cat or something. She just thought it was her nephew sneaking in. So she like just turned around, but it was not her nephew. It was a solid figure of a monk in a black monk's habit with, again, the hood up over its head. Apparently the way he was standing meant that May like couldn't see his face and she reported that she felt more curious than scared. But before she could do anything, it just completely vanished and was gone. At this time, Fred's other activity was still escalating with the banging noises being absolutely deafening by this point. The entity was apparently adding other delightful noises to its repertoire, including standing outside of their bedroom doors and breathing heavily. No thank you. But there was one night that would forever make 30 East Drive notorious for being the location of one of the most violent poltergeist attacks in the UK. It would be the only time that Fred would actually physically attack Diane, but oh my God, was it a vicious, violent attack. Diane was going down to get a coffee one evening. I mean, right, okay. I'm gonna pause here just a second. What a psychopath. Who drinks coffee in the evening? I drink a coffee past 3 p.m. and I'm awake with eyes on sticks until like four in the morning. But anyway, not the point. Diane was going to make coffee when almost predictably by this point, the lights went out but there was something different about this time. Jean heard her daughter scream and ran into the hallway to see Diane being dragged up the staircase. Even with the lights out, it was still early enough in the evening that the family could like see pretty clearly and they reported that they could clearly see Diane's cardigan being stretched out in front of her. Like you know when like you grab someone's shirt and like pull it, like it was like that. Fred's other hand was apparently around Diane's throat. Philip and Jean scrambled up the stairs after Diane and went to like try and get this unseen entity to let go, at which point it did and they all fell back down the stairs. Diane was obviously incredibly frightened after this. And yet again, the entity had left a mark on her in the form of fingerprints around her neck. That was enough, Fred had to go. One of Joe Pritchard's mates mentioned to him that hanging garlic was used for more than just keeping vampires away. And after what had happened to Diane, like anything was worth a punt at this point. So with the entire house smelling of garlic, the Pritchards carried on with daily life and miraculously, the activity seemed to stop just like that, allegedly. But we're gonna get all into that. I mean, like you can clearly see from the time on the video that we still have a lot more to talk about. The Pritchards continued to live in 30 East Drive and it wasn't until like 10 years later that a local historian and researcher called Tom Cuniff came across the story. That's when he got Colin Wilson involved and the story like really started to get some publicity. So Tom, as a local historian who was looking into the Cluniac monks of Pontefract, he was looking at this case from the angle of that there was an ancient priory near to Checkerfields, so that must have been where the entity came from. But I think that the explanation about its origin is a little bit more true to the classic poltergeist story, like Colin Wilson talks about in his book, that usually poltergeist activity occurs during particularly emotional or troubling times, normally when a child in the house is going through puberty. The entity first appeared in 1966, when Philip was 15, going through puberty, and apparently may have not been getting on very well with his dad, who was disappointed that he was more into books and music instead of sports like he was. So there was a little friction in the household. I mean, that would also explain why a family holiday to Devon would have been Philip's 
idea of hell. As to why it went dormant for a few years, maybe it was just waiting for Diane to go through puberty? I don't really know. So at the time of the hauntings in the 60s, there were only really like a couple of articles in the Yorkshire Evening Post and the Pontefract and Castleford Express, but it doesn't really seem like anything really came about of it. Like word had spread locally about the house that it was known for being haunted, and actually even like wannabe paranormal investigators would camp out outside of the house because Jean Pritchard like refused to let them inside, which apparently didn't put anyone off as the bumps and bangs that were allegedly caused by Fred were so loud and so frequent that you could hear them from outside anyway. After the publication of Colin Wilson's book, there was quite a bit of interest around the house, but eventually that died off again. And all throughout this time, the Pritchards continued to live in the house. Philip and Diane, they obviously grew up, moved out and started living their own lives on their own. And still Jean and Joe Pritchard lived in the house. But apparently things hadn't entirely gone back to normal. At the end of Colin Wilson's book, he says that Fred's manifestations had like completely went away, like that was the end of it, case closed kind of thing. But according to neighbors and friends who were still witnessing the activity, the entity never really went anywhere. It just calmed down enough to stop dragging 15 year old girls up flights of stairs by their throats, you know. And to be fair, it sounds like Fred wasn't only going for Diane during the height of his manifestations anyway. And the reason I'm putting this particular event here is because Colin Wilson doesn't speak about it in his book, which has led some skeptics to think that it's completely made up after the fact. But let me know what you think about this. Because the story goes that at some point during the time when the activity was most active, it did target Joe Pritchard. So in 30 years drive, there is a cupboard next to the downstairs toilet and it is what is known as a coal house, which as the name kind of gives away is where you would store your coal to use in your coal fireplace to keep your house warm. Apparently one day Joe was in the coal house, I'm assuming to either take out or put in coal, when he noticed that his national coal board jacket had been buried in the coal. And like this was the jacket that was given to miners to wear at work. Like it had like a reflective orange on it kind of thing. Now Joe already had quite a strained relationship with his son Philip by this point. Philip wasn't into sports like we mentioned. He just wasn't the kind of son that Joe wanted. So Joe naturally just assumed that it was Philip that had buried his jacket in the coal. Like the jacket was a representation of his dad and what he stood for. Like he was a man's man and he was into sports and he was a coal miner, like that sort of thing. If there was friction there, then it would definitely send a message. So I get why Joe immediately assumed that it was Philip that had done it. Immediately, he went to go and cuss out Philip, but he never got the chance. Before Joe could even leave the coal house, the door swung shut and locked Joe inside. He never spoke of what actually happened in that room, but when he came out, he was covered in bruises and apparently a completely broken man. And when I say the door locked, there wasn't an actual lock on the door. The door was easy enough to open and close at any point. Like it should have been impossible for Joe, like this strong miner, to not open the door himself. This attack was mentioned multiple times in Richard and Bill's book. And every time they said that after this attack, Joe was like completely changed. It was even Joe that floated the idea to G that they should move. That's how badly this affected him. Which I mean, come on, like, that does sound absolutely terrifying. Like the coal house is such a small room, there are no windows, it, it would have been complete darkness. You can't see anything, you can't open the door, and there's something in there attacking you. Absolutely not, no, no thank you. So I'm gonna mention the biggest hole in this story is that if it did happen during the late 60s hauntings, why wasn't it included in Colin Wilson's book? because that's sort of taken as like the authority on the haunting, because Colin obviously like spoke to the family members himself and all of that. But it is funny, Colin only mentions the coal house once when Jean's friend, Irene Holden, her white mohair coat disappeared one day. Literal weeks later, they found that coat in the coal shed underneath the coal. When they pulled it out, the coat was still completely white. No coal dust, marks, nothing on it at all. So it's funny that there was a very similar story in his book about the coal house house, but not the alleged event involving Joe. And so I can see why a lot of people are critical of the stories floating around the house now. Like we're gonna get into it, but the current owner makes a very big deal about the coal house being the most violent and haunted spot in the house, where that didn't seem to be the case like at all in Colin's book. So I can see like where the skeptics are coming from. However, just gonna play devil's advocate here for a second, if you'll humor me. Joe Pritchard, right? Man of the house, Yorkshireman in the 60s. He's working class, salt of the earth, 
spades a spade kind of guy. I mean, for God's sake, this guy was a coal miner. He's used to spending time in the dark, in confined spaces. That's fine. Like, he's not gonna be one to go down to the working men's club on a Friday night and start talking to his minor buddies about getting attacked by a ghost just because he locked himself in the coal house, would he? So he especially wouldn't like some author publishing a story about him getting locked in his own coal house and being attacked. Like, just because he 100% knew for a fact that his house was haunted didn't mean that the other men would have seen it that way. He would have been a laughing stock. It would have been humiliating for him. And so if that story was ever gonna come to light, it would be after he passed away, right? Which, sadly, he did just that on the 21st of June, 1986. Actually, inside 30 East Drive. He collapsed on the floor of the upstairs bathroom and the coroner ruled that he had suffered a fatal heart attack. So it might be only after that that people began talking about what happened to Joe and that's why it only made it into later books. So I don't know, just something to think about. But what do you think? Tell me your thoughts below, please, I'd love to know. After her husband passed away and the kids had moved out, Jean continued to live at 30's Drive on her own for years with a pet parrot to keep her company. Eventually, in 2008, Jean would finally come to the reluctant decision that it was time to put the house on the market and move into a retirement home. But stories from Carol Fieldhouse, who had moved into what was May Mountain's house, so 79 Checkerfield Road next door, would shed some light on how Jean actually lived all of those years in that house alone, which possibly included a ghost or two, apparently. One of the last conversations that Carol had actually had with Jean had been about the hauntings in the house. Jean had mentioned to Carol that she was thinking of selling up when Carol was like, oh, you should probably like let whoever's gonna buy it know about the hauntings. Like you don't want any sort of fallback if anything like started back up again. And this was said like innocently enough, like Carol had just been talking about what happened in the 60s, which was like common knowledge in the area. Like everyone knew 30 East Drive was the haunted house kind of thing. But Jean actually responded saying that the activity had never really gone away that she was continuing to live with it all of these years and that for some reason it was actually getting really bad again. Jean had even got to the point where she was now living in the kitchen and she'd even got locks installed on the French doors to the living room to try and keep Fred locked in the living room away from her in the nicest way possible. I'm not sure what that's gonna do against an entity that can materialize things out of thin air and lock full grown men in cupboards, but I appreciate the attempt. I understand what she was doing. I think that really goes some way as to like showing how Jean was actually living by the end of it, like quite clearly the woman was being affected by something in that house. So that was the end of the conversation. Jean and Carol just like, they went back into their own houses and that was kind of it for a few years. They'd sort of like exchange pleasantries until eventually Carol just stopped seeing Jean at all. But she knew that Jean must be okay and that maybe she hadn't decided to move after all as Carol could still hear the TV going through like the dividing wall most nights. Like clearly she was still living there. Like maybe instead like one of her grandkids had moved in to look after her instead. Like it could have been something like that. So one day Carol saw Philip, the son, heading into the house on a very rare visit. He didn't really go back to the house very much and thought she'd just like collar him and ask if his mom was okay. Like Carol hadn't seen her for a while so just wanted to make sure that like everything was good. So she says like, oh Philip, is your mom okay? Like I keep hearing the TV going at full blast most nights kind of thing. Philip, bless him. Like he doesn't visit the house very often, probably still scarred from what happened when he was a teenager there. After Carol says that, he just stands there looking at her like completely pale. He goes, Carol, my mum moved out months ago. The house has been empty ever since. Well, Carol, like, she just can't believe it. She was like, no, surely not. Like, she's moving about all the time. I can hear her in there, the TV's going. I can even hear the parrot calling after her. Nope. The parrot moved to the animal sanctuary when mum moved out. So unsurprisingly, no one in the area wanted to touch the house with a barge pole. And the tired old ex-council house would sit on the market for four years before the current owner, Bill Bungie, would come along. So a little backstory on our friend Bill, whose name you might recognise because he was one of the co-authors of the book, The Black Monk of Pontefract, along with Richard Estep. Bill first came to learn about 30 East Drive via a colleague of his who was doing some copywriting down in London for him. And the copywriter's name was Pat Holden, and he was the son of one of Jean Pritch's friends, Irene Holden. Like, you remember the one that had the white mohair coat go missing and rematerialize in the coal house? That was Pat's mom. So Pat had grown up, like, listening to all the stories that his mom would tell him about the house and the resident ghost, Fred. But he was too young at the time to visit the house himself. 
So there he was, he'd heard stories about Fred for years and years, and Jean Pritchard was obviously a close family friend, so Pat Holden, he had this absolute fascination with the place, which eventually resulted in him writing and directing the film When the Lights Go Out. So Pat was directing it, and Bill Bungie, he produced it. And so I've mentioned the film a couple of times already, but basically the film was a dramatisation of the Pritchard's time living in the house during the 60s, when things were like really kicking off. And it is a good watch. Like I watched it while I was doing the research for this video and it's a B movie. It gives B movie vibes, but I love a good B movie. Like they have a good heart. And I genuinely found that in places like I was quite tense, you know, like when you know something's gonna happen, but you don't quite know what, like I honestly think they did do a really good job and I would watch it again. So they actually filmed everything in Huddersfield, which is a few miles away from the actual house because they thought that Jean was still living in the original 30 East Drive and so probably wanted nothing to do with the film, beans as she was like getting on a little bit now. And it wasn't until after the film had been created that Bill was looking for ways to promote it. Bill was still working in marketing even after he had produced this film. So of course, like he wanted to get a, a little creative with the promotion. I don't blame him. As coincidental as it was, Bill was actually traveling up from London to Pontefract to meet with a client. So obviously like he's just done this whole ass film on the place. Like of course he's gonna go and check out the supposedly haunted house that he's just dedicated what I'm gonna guess is months of his spare time to. So there he was, rocked up in front of the infamous house and he sees the for sale sign. Yep, the damn house was sitting there empty. They could have used it to film in. Although maybe if he knew then what he now knows, maybe that wouldn't have been the best option. Can you imagine though, like all of that expensive film equipment and a ghost that likes to throw things around? Yeah, not a good combo. <laughs> So while they'd missed the opportunity to use the actual house in the filming, Bill wasn't gonna lose out on the marketing campaign of a lifetime. Not long after visiting the house for the first time, he'd signed the paperwork and bought himself a haunted as hell house. They had the classic Leicester Square premiere for the film, but they had the actual premiere in the very same living room where the Pritchards were tormented by Fred all of those years ago, which I think is an absolutely brilliant idea. It didn't sound like there were very many people actually in the room either. The book mentioned that there were two competition winners and I'm guessing maybe like some cast and crew or something. Fred decided that the premiere of the film that was about him clearly wasn't the right time to make his presence known. And the people attending the premiere at 30 East Drive didn't notice anything paranormal normal at all. But this is where the popularity of the house just completely blew up. And I think sort of ignited the fire that just skyrocketed 30 East Drive's popularity. Like now people are coming from all over the world to see this haunted house. They were obviously playing on the haunted house element and getting the most out of Bill's investment. Like all of the PR events were being held at the house. And up until this point, Bill was a skeptic. He didn't really believe in ghosts all that much. Oh, you know I'm about to tell you all about how he changed his mind. He got his first dose of weird when he first met the next door neighbor, Carol Fieldhouse, at one of the PR events for the film. Now, Carol, she claims to be quite sensitive psychically, if that's a word. I think it's a word. The first thing she ever said to Bill was that the black monk is standing at the bottom of the stairs watching you right now, and he's given you a year to get out. Nice to meet you too. Still, very creepy thing to say to someone the first time you meet them. His second weird encounter would happen when, again, he was at a PR event at the house, like, putting in those hours. Like, filming the thing is only half the battle. You gotta then fight to get people to watch the thing after you've made it, you know? There were some cast members over at the house, so Bill decided to grab a photo with them and handed his phone over to a woman to take the photo for him. She was just about to take the photo when Bill's iPhone went from 75% battery all the way down to dead. Like, it just shut down. And I mean, if that's where the story ended, like, sometimes iPhones do weird things, like, that's just a fact of the natural world. But still, weird that it went from three quarters charged down to dead. Eventually, when he was able to recharge his phone and check to see on the off chance whether the photo had actually been taken, he was a bit irked, like not thrilled that there was no photo. He checked all of his libraries just in case, you know, like iPhones do very weird things sometimes, but nothing. That was until weeks later, up popped an incredibly blurry but unmistakable photo of Bill and the two cast members at 30 East Drive. Like what? I'd, how does that even happen? Very weird. 
and not really known to be one of iPhone's quirks. Like still, not really completely solid proof that anything paranormal has gone on at this point. Until he stayed behind at 30 East Drive to lock up, after a small crew of documentary filmmakers had been using the house to like film in. By this point it was two in the morning and it was just him and a couple of helpers. So he was just like going around, checking the house out, picking up any litter and just like generally tidying up outside. The film crew had left by this point, so he started to lock up, including closing the two big like wrought iron gates gates. And these were the type of gates where they would have like the bolt that drops into the floor when they're closed. You, you know the ones. And so Bill was locking up the house like entirely before he drove back to London. He was doing the proper checks and locks that you do. I know you know what I mean, where if you're leaving the house empty for longer than 24 hours, you'll go around and check every single lock, rattle every window, even though you've never in your life of living there, open them. What I'm trying to say is he was very aware of what he was doing. So he went so far as to push like a concrete block up behind the gate so that if anyone was gonna try and get in, they would struggle, you know? At that point, the two people that were helping him like came out the house and he turned to face them. So he was facing the house with his back to the gates. He asked them if they were ready to go. Funnily enough, they couldn't wait to get out there and get back home. <laughs> so he was just like, okay, we'll lock up and then we can, and he froze in the middle of his sentence looking back in the direction of the gates. One of them was wide freaking open. The concrete block tossed off to the side as if it was nothing. This was two in the morning. There was no one on that street that could have done it silently in the time it took him to ask the two people if they were ready to go and not get noticed by the people coming out of the house. There was zero wind, not that I have ever seen any wind in England strong enough to push a concrete block. That was it. That moment right there, Bill knew for sure just how haunted 30 East Drive was and quite clearly there was still some sort of entity that was still there at the house. Still his rational brain would like continue to try and debunk what he saw like surely somehow some way there was an explanation that didn't involve ghosts. He started inviting different people around, like seeing what they sort of experienced and loads of them reported weirdly similar things that the Pritchards had done years before. Things were flying through the air, bumps and bangs that were like way above normal house noises, lights turning on and off, and of course, dark shadows wandering about. So now it's the 14th of February, 2016. And Bill was around at 30 East Drive, like doing one of his inspections, making sure everything was okay, the house was still standing, like all of that. And he was washing up some bits in the kitchen sink when he heard footsteps upstairs, followed immediately by banging noises in the cupboard next to him. By this point, like Bill was 100% convinced that there was something in the house. Like every time he entered the house, he would announce to Fred that he was there and to please not freak him out. I mean, say less, like I get that. As Bill was stood there at the kitchen sink, the hairs on the back of his neck stood on end. Like you know when you just know that you're not alone. He was convinced that when he turned around, he was either gonna see Carol the neighbor or like a member of the paranormal team that helped to like get the house set up for evening investigations, that sort of thing. Or that he was gonna come face to face with the shadowy robed figure of the black monk himself. Bill slowly started to turn his head around to see who was there. Honestly, I think I would have just kept my eyes shut and just said, no, thank you. Like, I don't think I would have even wanted to know, honestly. There was no one there, but instead, apparently, a domino materialized and started hurtling towards his face, changing course at the last second and missing his face by millimeters. Bill had just experienced one of Fred's absolute staple moves, his bread and butter. But what happens after that, quite honestly, just belongs in a horror movie. I'm sorry, but I absolutely draw the line. I'm sure throughout this whole story, I would have drawn the line so many other times, at so many other points, the line would just be a scribbly mess by this point. But Bill was getting ready to make the trip back down to London when he was just like chatting and catching up with Carol and her helpers that looked after the place while Bill was at home. I mean, Bill had just had this like elite tier poltergeist activity happen right in front of his face. Like they were gonna talk about it. They heard a pop and then a bouncing coming from the kitchen, almost like someone had dropped a ping pong ball. Carol went to go and investigate when she saw that her young granddaughter had like strolled in and was like looking for her. And she was biting on one of those things like, you know, those like artificial polystyrene oranges that you get in like, what are they called? They're like, you, you go into like a showroom and they're like showing you all these different model kitchens and they've got like the fake fruit bowl there. And then you've got like the bananas and the apples and the oranges. Like one of those, it was one of those. She was a bit like, uh, okay, darling, please don't bite that. That's not a real orange. And also where did you get this orange from anyway? This kid, no, no thank you, honestly. 
You know what she said? As if it was the most normal thing in the world. The man in black gave it to me. Nope, nope. There was a bowl of artificial fruit on the kitchen counter. Funnily enough, now missing an orange. If this kid had made it up, that was a very specific fib to be telling. And apparently she was very young at the time. So personally, I don't think she would have been capable of lying like that. But also she might have heard a family talk a lot about the black monk. So maybe she picked up on all of that. I don't know. I think I'm more just trying to make myself feel better at this point. And so in this story, we've been chatting for quite a while now. I've included what were to me the most terrifying encounters that were reported at 30 East Drive that are just so compelling that I can't even... I just can't even, okay? Throughout the rest of Bill and Rich's book, there is so much alleged activity that's happened from so many different people. If you wanna read about different people's experiences, what's happened, absolutely do it. There was so much in this book or just watch like the hours and hours of YouTube footage that's out there. There is loads of it. Like Most Haunted have filmed there and Nick Groff's show Paranormal Lockdown that he did, they were there. And even like YouTube channels like the Ouija Brothers. And I won't give it all away because it's like a whole chapter in Richard's book, but basically when they first went in there, the Ouija brothers, they weren't actually YouTubes at that point. They were just sort of like going to see what the deal was kind of thing. And it resulted in Carol the neighbor ringing Bill the morning after saying that they needed to be banned, which is what happened to people if, like if they made too much noise and were just quite clearly just messing about kind of thing, which is what Carol thought they were doing. She thought they were just like having a piss up or whatever. Turns out it was because they were experiencing so much activity from growling, knives moving about, like just so much. Like honestly, their story is wild. But with the things that people are experiencing at East Drive, a lot of people aren't 100% sure about what actually is haunting the place. We don't even really know if it's the same entity that tormented the Pritchards and the Farrers because a lot of people don't think so. A theory that just seems to be getting like more and more popular is that the spirit of Joe Pritchard has actually come back to haunt his former home. On the show Paranormal Lockdown, Nick's co-host Katrina was going through like the initial walkthrough when they got to the bathroom upstairs, which is the exact room that Joe passed away in. For just a split second, she was convinced that she saw the reflection of a man with kind of like dirty blonde hair in the bathroom mirror. Considering the only other men around didn't match that description, they were kind of led to believe that possibly, maybe it might have been Joe. Now, I don't know about this one in particular, if I'm being completely honest. I don't know if it was the case while Nick and Katrina were at the house, but what I've seen in other videos is that in the living room, there is a printout image of Joe on the wall. And I don't know, maybe like your subconscious brain puts two and two together in that split second, or yeah, maybe the spirit of Joe manifested in the reflection of the bathroom mirror. Another claim that's quite often made about 30 East Drive is that the ghosts aren't human at all. And there is actually a demonic entity that haunts the house house. Animalistic, you know, like really guttural growls have been captured on EVP recorders on more than one occasion around the area of the coal house. You know, those ones that just really don't sound human. People have also been physically attacked with scratches, like red marks, all that kind of stuff being reported. Some people believe that there are multiple portals within the house and that's the reason why it is so active with so much negative energy. And it's so hard to imagine, isn't it? Like this completely unassuming council house being such a portal to hell basically. But there are a few theories knocking about as to why 30 East Drive. Like why? Really though, why? Like what's so special? Firstly, we've already touched on it before, but the possibility of the houses being built over like that very old well. It's pretty widely believed that water has the potential to amplify any spiritual energy in a location. So that would go some way to explaining why the activity is so frequent and violent. Another theory that both Bill and Carol talk about in the book is Ouija boards and that they, at some point, they weren't shut down properly and that's left open portals basically. So now it's just like a free for all in the spiritual world. Of course, I've also got to address a theory that it is all BS. Like that it is all completely made up, that the Pritchards made it all up, that Bill has just twisted this entire story to sell his movie and now his book and continues to rake in the money on what is basically a glorified scare fest. Like any paranormal story, it's entirely possible. And I mean, come on, like how brilliant of a marketing campaign can you get for a horror movie than having exclusive rights and access to the house that the movie's about? Like doesn't get better than that. And the Pritchards, and to be fair, the Farrers was 30 
piece drive, like not all it cracked up to be. So they wanted to fake the entire thing to get a better council house. Again, entirely possible. Because yes, Bill and Barbara Farrah got a new house, although I'm not entirely sure whether it was like an upgrade or not. But Jean Pritchard continued to live in that house until she moved into an old folks home. Hardly the behavior of a woman that wanted a new house. Like not even her husband being beat up in the coal shed and her daughter dragged up the stairs by her throat was enough to get Jean to move. But then other people have said like, oh, well, where are Philip and Diane? Like, why haven't they come forward and done interviews? Or they would have done if that was real. Like, excuse me, not necessarily. Janet Hodgson, the kid from the Enfield poltergeist case, did come forward and do interviews and all it got her was people calling her a liar. Maybe the things that Philip and Diane did experience in that house were so viscerally real, so traumatizing, that they can't bear talking about it in public. So that explanation doesn't feel quite right either. And with Bill, surely if he were faking it, if there were different machines or whatever to fake the banging and the throwing things and the pre-recorded noises and the voices, like surely that would give off its own EMF reading so that they'd pretty quickly like find live wires and whatnot. I'm not 100% clued up on technology and paranormal investigations, but let me know in the comments, would that be a thing? I'm pretty sure it would be a thing. So obviously like whatever you believe or don't believe, it is now, it's basically like a haunted house for hire. Like you can pay to go and spend the night at 30 East Drive. So when you do go, like expect a little atmosphere setting by the house itself. Bill was obviously very intentional with the things that he put in the house because the house was actually like pretty much empty when he bought it. So he got all of the furniture and whatnot from charity shops, but it's very heavy on the religious symbols, Bibles, crosses, and like all of that, obviously being specifically placed there to make you think of the monk or maybe like to try and fight the evil in the house. It's also got some super creepy pictures and these porcelain dolls with the dead glass eyes. Yeah loads of those. And I think it was very clever. It's very intentional to make you feel like you're back in the late sixties. Like Jean Pritchard is just gonna come walking through the kitchen at any moment. And it can kind of condition you to be in that mindset of like, oh, this is a very creepy house. Like something's gonna happen. And there's newspaper clippings up on the wall. So like you can read about what's happened. So you already know like what sort of things you could experience. So you never know, if you decide to spend the night, you might be the next witness of the infamous hooded monk. So decades after the alleged black monk of Pontefract made his presence known, the entity or multiple other entities continue to torment anyone who dares feel brave enough to enter 30 East Drive. Wow, <laughs> Woo, we made it. What do you think? We have a lot to unpack here. Please tell me your thoughts, your opinions, lay them all on me. Have you ever visited 30 East Drive? Do you have any stories about the Black Monk of Pontefract? Or do you know something about the case that we didn't talk about today? Please let me know everything down below in the comments. I absolutely love reading other people's ghostly experiences and opinions. Before I get to my thoughts about the place, I just need to take a moment. I really feel like we've been on a journey today. Oh my God, what a journey. <laughs> I can't believe how long this one turned out to be. Like I knew it was gonna be a big boy, but Wow, that was something else. Actually, let me have a look. I've been recording for two hours and 21 minutes straight. That is a lot. I have lived and breathed this story for a good solid fortnight. <laughs> I got to the point where I was looking like Charlie, looking for Pepe Sylvia, you know? Like it, it's always sunny in Philadelphia, like staring at the board of post-it notes, looking for the paper trail, like it got deep, man. <laughs> So now what do I think about 30 East Drive? I think that really the question that if 30 East Drive is haunted or not, it comes down to two questions really. Was it haunted during the 60s? Yes, undoubtedly. Like why would the Pritchards make it up? They gained nothing. Like if anything, they lost people in the community. Like some people either refused to step foot in the house or others would completely avoid the family because they thought they were batshit making all this stuff up about their house. They didn't get famous, they didn't get money, no one paid money for their story, and Jean Pritchard didn't even want a new house off the council. There was no reason to make it all up, and yet this crazy stuff happened. So yes, I believe it was haunted then. Is it haunted now? Also yes. I do believe that it is, 
because there is so much new evidence coming out all of the time. Like, and for so many people to go on record and say these things happen to them, I do believe there is still something in that house. Like seriously, just search 30 East Drive on YouTube and look at how many paranormal investigation videos come up. What is actually haunting the place? I have no idea. However, and it is a big however, the whole place is geared up now for optimal ghost hunting experiences. The owner directly benefits from people coming and spending the night in the house and experiencing some sort of activity. So the creepy pictures and the old furniture and everything is completely geared up for that. Then you combine that with people who book onto these overnight things at the house. They already know the house. They know the story. They've watched the film. They know at least the gist of some of the activity that went down there. So they're already going into this thing, like expecting something to happen, they're most likely bricking it before they've even gone through the front door, like let's be honest. So then normal house noises become poltergeist activity and it just carries on. But then some groups go in and they don't experience anything, which would then track as like a genuine haunt out. Like you could just keep going back and forth with yourself forever until you actually go to the house and experience something concrete, like a domino to the face or something. So yes, I do think it's haunted. That is my final opinion. But if you're gonna go there, try and go with an open mind and not think that like every single noise is a ghost. Which I know that there are so many amazing paranormal groups out there that do showcase more of that like balanced view. So kudos to you guys. But please do let me know what you think. But anyway, that is all from me today. I'm gonna stop talking at you and I'm gonna go take a lie down because that was so much, but I had fun. Did you have fun? I hope you had fun and I hope you learned a little something too. Anyway, I cannot wait to chat with you a little bit more tomorrow, a little bit more tomorrow. Get ready, it's another big one. We're covering one of the heavy hitters from the US of A. So until next time, sleep safe. This one actually someone specifically requested, which was great. Ouija brothers just coming through again. <laughs>